Welcome to the Concrete Solutions Network. Good morning, listeners. On our segment this morning, we have a nice guest joining us from the Evergreen State, Washington, and it's Jerry Sargent with Slabjack Geotechnical out of Wenatchee, Washington. Jerry, welcome to the show this morning. How are you? It's great to be here. Terrific, Jerry. Appreciate you coming on. Folks, this morning, what we're going to cover, we're going to dive into a little bit of a technical discussion. And what we're going to focus on, and Jerry's going to elaborate on for us, is specifically the use of chemical grouts and resins, both single and plural component, when to use which and in which situations you would use either the single or double, kind of why. And then, Jerry, if you could, we'd like to have you elaborate a little bit on maybe some of the techniques and some of the technical details on the how, which I think is going to be probably of the most value to our listeners. So we do appreciate you, Jerry, coming back on board um, here and uh, joining us on the show. So, Jerry, if you could uh, maybe reference some uh, jobs in the the years that you've been doing this and talk a little bit about, you know, Slabjack Geotechnical and uh, what you guys do and uh, give our listeners an idea as to some of the insight you've got in the years you've been doing this on, on single and plural component utilization with the urethanes in a geotechnical application. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Jerry. Well, I'm happy to do that. And, you know, people that know me know that I can go on for, for hours about this. I'm very, <laughs> very passionate about it. We Terrific. got into the slab jacking side of the business um, you know, about a decade ago. And, of course, slab lifting, um, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, we When we started to expand, over into the Puget Sound market, we really found a, a niche there for seawall stabilization, compaction grouting, and permeation grouting. Nice. Um, this has kind of led into, you know, the void filling types of applications with plural component and the permeation grouting to stabilize material both behind seawalls and more importantly, oftentimes under seawalls because of the scouring nature of tides that, that pull material um, away from seawalls. Absolutely. Um, you know, some of the jobs we've done, primarily these are residential jobs. And um, if you're familiar at all with Washington State, there's a lot of a lot of uh, oceanfront, lakefront properties. Yes. And all of these are prone to erosion, washout, and deterioration. And by using these types of grouts, both plural and single component, we extend the life of these by many years. Of course, the challenge that we have now with EPA and fisheries and Army Corps of Engineers and others is that uh, replacement of these structures is, is, is extremely time consuming and horrendously uh, many times on a poured concrete wall they won't even let you replace it with it with a like type of wall they'll force you then to go back to a more natural type of ocean front which is oftentimes slope or or boulders so these kinds of things very non-obtrusive you can typically get in and out in a day on most residential projects and very uh, very quick to do the work and so the customers really are looking for a simple solution that is that really saves them in many cases hundreds of thousands of dollars um, yeah. so we're really excited about this this market it's been something that you can get into with with a minimal investment of equipment and and hop right in as long as as long as you have uh, some information. I'm assuming that's why we're here today. Yeah, absolutely, Jerry, and we appreciate that. That's that's a tremendous uh, intro as to what you guys do. We, we thank you for that, Jerry. As as it relates to what you're talking about, some of these residences, I had the good fortune of uh, being able to head on over to Bainbridge Island, uh, very uh, high end, exclusive area with with you know very nice residences and and like you said right up against the water these um, mini type of seawalls and stuff uh, I had a chance to take a look at one and and it's exactly in line with what you're saying one thing if you could and we don't have to get into too much detail but the permitting was one of the huge hurdles that came up in the instance where I had a chance to head on over to Bainbridge Island can you talk just briefly about your experiences as it relates to some of the permitting I uh, just went that'll be kind of a bit of an administrative flavored um, item here in the, in the segment and can you can you elaborate on the permitting for these types of jobs? Sure. Um, generally speaking, when we're when we're dealing with permitting issues, there's usually an engineer involved, mm-hmm. and the engineer the engineer typically will take care of those kinds of. Uh, administrative tasks. In a lot of cases, when an engineer is involved, we're talking about an emergent pair, something that 
they can expedite the process. The challenge that you have permitting these is that they can be a fairly lengthy process, uh, oftentimes involving months. And so um, oftentimes we will ask the homeowner to get that process going. Gotcha. Uh, there is a, there's a financial commitment there. Um, the, yeah. uh, you know, I'm sure every state's different to a degree, but Army Corps is nationwide and fisheries is nationwide. And then, of course, you have some county stuff that you deal with. Um, mm -hmm. So if your county is lax, they'll probably be a little bit. But anytime you're putting in grouts uh, that potentially get into the waterways, they're concerned about that. Understood. So there needs to be, you know, if you're working behind the wall, that's what you're working um, on a lake where the water level is consistent. You're going to have material outcropping into the lake. You need to have, you know, screens to capture that material and um, the appropriate permits. Fortunately, uh, in most cases, when we're talking permitting, the engineer is already involved at that stage and he's taking care of that for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, terrific, Jerry. Uh, technically speaking, quickly on, on the note of the resins, either single or dual component, do you find it advantageous when you're doing these types of jobs next to a lake or a, a spot that has, you know, environmentally sensitive, you know, you got all eyes watching, the, the, the testing criteria for any given resin that supports the reacted product to be safe to come in contact with potable water, so that NSF 61 approval, does that weigh into your selection process when choosing a grout either single or plural component to, to use on one of these applications? It, it certainly can. And, and again, the permitting process will, will oftentimes demand that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, personally, when we look at a project like that, a lot of it depends on if we're going to have direct water. Right, right. Um, so in a in a tide situation where you're often, you're generally working at, at low tide, so you're, the water is no longer on the wall, that's not as critical of a concern because any outcrop material you're, you're getting rid of before the water comes back up. Um, you know, so plural components, definitely hydrophobic materials, mm -hmm. um, single single components, you know, the NS61 and those kinds of materials are, are certainly the things that we're looking for to avoid, um, you know, problems with EPA. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Um, <laughs> Jerry, so now moving forward into, into application. Uh, just your your mental flow chart on the the i the idea behind choosing single versus dual. Can you walk our listeners maybe through that that process? That you know some of the things that absolutely help you determine. Hey, I'm going to go single component or dual component on any given job. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I kind of feel like a little bit like the Wild West. There's lots of guns <laughs> going off, lots of guns going off, and no people involved, no sheriff around. <laughs> right. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people that um, that are into slab jacking think that they can jump right across and see wall stabilization with plural component material. And while some instances the plural component makes sense, um, a material that can raise several thousand pounds from one injection hole can also push several thousand thousand pounds laterally. Um, yeah. I get really concerned because the seawalls we work on, they need work, right? right? They're they're oftentimes cracked. They oftentimes maybe already have a little bow to them. Yep. And injecting an, a highly expansive foam behind a wall is something that you should not take lightly. You just right. don't inject that stuff blindly and squeeze the trigger and pump yards of material behind a wall um, yeah. without it, without being willing to accept some risk. Risky um, business, so sure. Yeah. Oh, gee, yeah. I mean, it, first of all, most liability insurances for a slab jack operator are not going to cover uh, pushing a seawall out. They're not going to cover pushing a foundation out of position. Right. So you got to be really careful about these and take those into account. Now, of course, the the advantage of plural component is it's much less costly. Um, right. You know, the, the material itself is really inexpensive uh, compared to a single component. However, you're talking about an investment here that's probably a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars, people, right. if they had to replace it. So if somebody needs to spend $10,000 and $500, but you're going to do the project right, you need to use the right material. And, and choosing to select that really depends on what exactly. For example, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these cord, uh, poured concrete walls that we are working on have erosion problems beneath the footer. Yeah. Um, these things are typically poured, you know, a couple feet below grade, but as happens when you've got a poured concrete wall, you lose sand in front of it. And over time, that footer gets exposed. And so one of the things that is really great about uh, these single components like the Seal Boss and 10 and others is that those can be injected at depth below the wall. So we would typically use a grout needle 
And these come yep. in lengths from, you know, 18 inches to four feet. Heck, we even make our own if we need them deeper than that. Yeah, and the tube can... manchette style, right? Absolutely. And yeah. that just hooks right up to a, an airless sprayer. And we have a couple of different ones. Mm-hmm. Depending on the project, you know, you can really, you know, switch between material or switch between machines. Typically, we're going to use the big machine as faster to pump material. But we drive that, that, uh, that grout needle into the ground at the depth that um, typically the engineer will specify. That may be uh-huh. two feet below, two feet below grade, maybe four feet below grade, and then we grout from the bottom up. And so, uh-huh. in many cases, yeah, in many cases, if we're in, let's say we're in uh, sand and cobble, yep. oftentimes it's it's almost like a pea gravel material, and that is perfect yeah, for it single is. component material. Oh, it's just yeah. a cat meow. Good and take. so you you drive that down, yeah, and you put you drop the uh, Drop the airless sprayer in the five-gallon bucket with the appropriate amount of catalyst, and you pump roughly a half a gallon foot. So we'll have a guy there at the five-gallon container, and and he can let us know when we've pumped a half a gallon. We'll raise that grout needle roughly a foot, pump another half gallon, raise it, and we bring that up right to the bottom of the wall. That solidifies that soil in extremely hard polyurethane matrix mixed with that sand and cobble. Um, yeah. In essence, what we are doing is we are extending the footer of the seawall down below the area in which tides and the currents scour that material out. Yeah, that's terrific, Jerry. And, and we appreciate you too diving into some of the metrics. Um, for the listeners out there, this is this is the game, all right? And what I mean by that is very simply, these are, you know, and, and Jerry even mentioned, you mentioned there, Jerry, the idea of having somebody um, metering just with their <laughs> eye and saying, hey, we've used a half a gallon or a gallon and so forth and using those controls of the experiment uh, if you will, to accurately and with a process, a quality control almost built into your application, giving the job the due respect and and the attention that it deserves. So it's that monitoring, folks. That's what Jerry's hammering home here. That monitoring when you're doing jobs like this, where you're you're saving the client tons of money compared to what the alternative is. And Jerry, you touched on that, which would be to replace, right? The idea here is if we can perform with the technologies that are available to us in situ remedies, and it's not a band-aid, you are using the technologies available to you with methods and tools to be able to, like you said, enhance that footing below where it was originally built, you're you're doing a huge service for the clients that are that are signing you up. That's that's fantastic, Jerry. Yeah. Um so now now switching gears a little bit. Uh, not even or more on the topic in terms of uh, we talked about when to use duels versus singles and you, you touched on some of the spacing and and some of the flow rates and things like that that's fantastic um, what what in your observation is some of the most common pitfalls for guys you mentioned earlier on in the segment guys that do jacking sometimes think they can jump right over to using a dual component that's highly expansive um, Let's talk about when you should absolutely use a dual in instead of a single. So if you could talk a little bit about that, Jerry, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when there are voids, when you're targeting a very specific area for a, a seal, sometimes plural components make a lot of sense. So uh-huh. where we see this the most, I guess, where there's obvious gaps behind the wall or maybe in a, you know, in a big boulder type of, of uh, bulkhead where they've just used big rock rather than poured concrete. So uh, uh, plural components good for filling voids in there and helping to lock those big rocks and aggregate together. Yeah. Um, I think in, in most poured concrete walls, we stay away from plural components simply because of the risks associated with it. Um, going right along with that, you know, one of the things that um, plural component is not appropriate for is injecting underneath the walls. You can certainly push material back up in contact with the wall uh, by mm-hmm. using a plural uh, by using a, a plural component. However, there's virtually no uh, permeation involved with plural component polyurethanes. It'll it'll take a, it'll absorb a little. Um, It will push through a little bit of that, but it will not do it to the point where you have a solid structure built beneath the wall itself. Um, And I think that's really important to understand the the real limitation, the plural component polyurethane. And and we use hundreds of thousands of pounds of it a year in our slab jacking operation. But it really isn't appropriate in most cases to do a poured concrete wall uh, stabilization. 
Understood, Jerry. I appreciate that. You had touched on the idea earlier about the uh, the pea gravel sand, and you'd mentioned how um, advantageous that is to having a nice matrix of the polyurethane to solidify uh, some of the strata and the geostrata that you're aiming to solidify. I could not agree more. In fact, when I do the demonstrations and, and some of the distributor uh, uh alliances that we have out there if you folks are listening you've seen me do this where we'll take a um you know we'll just t- take a quadrant of a cmu box that they'll build and we'll, we'll dedicate that quadrant to having a sand and pea gravel mix and we'll inject a single component catalyzed and and you're spot on with your your uh, description jerry of what you get in the end game it's a dense almost rock hard type of a, a matrix where it just binds everything up now playing devil's advocate i'm sure you've run across this because we did encounter this when i went over to that uh that residence in bainbridge island your experience and if you could share with the listeners this morning jerry on single component and or dual probably more likely single and it's 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 struggle sometimes to get into silts and clays and just as a as if to, to yeah <laughs> to put a background and drop a canvas on this I, I got introduced to this idea, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I had the good fortune of being invited to the uh, UT Austin. They have a grouting course. It's a grouting short course. And listeners out there, if you can reach out uh, after, you know, I'm assuming after COVID's all said and done, you can reach out to UT Austin and maybe look into uh, attending that if it's of interest to you. It is a phenomenal, mind-blowing five days of just some of the best minds in the world, literally, getting up. And, and it, it does take on university format. You do sit through lectures. But one of the things they touched upon as it related to grouting in general, and especially, especially chemical grouting, was the challenges associated with <clears throat> getting that permeation through clays and silts and things like that. I don't want to go on and on about Jerry. I'd like for you, if you could expand a little bit, maybe on some experiences you've had and some challenges with that type of geostrata. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. And it's funny that you mentioned Bainbridge Island. We did two jobs there um, last week, uh, both residential, both fairly small, less than $10,000 each. There is some real problems with with clays, of course. Uh, in order to permeate clay, it needs to dry. And in a, you know, a tide or a lake application, it rarely is. Mm-hmm. And so there there are definite regards to uh, clays and permeation grouting. In some cases, um, I I recall one we did, I forget what lake it was on, but they have an annual drawdown. And we did a wall there. In fact, I think it's probably on our Facebook page somewhere Mm -hmm. where we actually did use a plural component to push that material up about eight inches. So the base of the wall was completely exposed. And so we drove pipe down into this blue clay and we just pumped until we had a massive pressure heave. So at least brought that material up to the base of that. Now, you're talking about something here that is a, a certainly a temporary fix. It will last them years before that begins to you know, uh, be eroded out again. But there are certainly limitations when you're doing permeation into clay. It's just, you know, it's not the ideal thing. And so sometimes you're going to have to look at, at other methods. And I think it's important, you know, that you ask yourself some very important questions. One of one of the things that we have as a motto in our company is and that is uh, every job needs to meet three criteria. Number one, it needs to be profitable. Number two, it needs to be doable. And number yeah. three, it needs to be in, it needs to be in the customer's best interest to do it. Yeah. There are, you know, there's a lot of people that are so scared they'll buy from you regardless of whether it's appropriate repair or remedy for their problem. And I think as a businessman, I want to be able to sleep at night. I want to provide services to my customers that are valuable and worthwhile. Couldn't agree and, more. You know, in yeah. some of those cases, when you're dealing with clay, and, and probably the majority of those cases, permeation grouting is not an ideal I, I, not an ideal um, solution. I think it's really important too to have partners in this in this business. So often we get so focused on us, forget that partners can really be beneficial to us and our clients, and they can help send business your way. We yep. do we do business. Uh, we refer business to a company called Sound Bulkhead. The guy's name is Chris also, um, right. and they do major structural repair and replacement. Gotcha. So. You know, like anything, you'll go out and see a job. It's beyond what we can do. It's beyond what we would be willing to repair. And so I would refer that to Chris at Sound Bulkhead. On the other hand, um, we deal with a fair number of walls that may have a crack and a bulge. Yeah. And so I deal with another company um, 
a Ram Jack, which is a peering company for a helical tieback anchor. Yeah. And so we did a job up in, I think it was Oak Harbor last year. Um, the engineer called out X number of pounds, a single component um, from another company, I might add, but I got... Uh, I got the seal boss approved and we used, we used your product. I uh, appreciate um, that. We got, and we got up there and it called out a of gallons. But when we got on site, um, the soil was very dense, would not take the amount of grout that we thought. Plus there was a r- rather significant displacement in the wall itself. Uh, um, I called the engineer and I said, this really needs a couple of tie back anchors. I said, I've already been in contact with, with my, uh, with a Ram Jack. They're quoting me X number of dollars for two of them. We need the engineering done on that. Yeah. So the engineer worked up all the numbers for him, sent that over to Ram Jack, determined that two anchors needed to be made. They needed to have uh, a whaler put in basically a big concrete yeah. block. And um, we were able to get that job done for the same amount of money um, that we had quoted in the original contract. And we, yeah. we came out just fine. I mean, it's, again, the customer got what they really, um, we didn't try and make any extra money on this situation and everybody left satisfied and happy. So I think that, you know, when we having partnerships with a, with a supplier, with other companies help us in what we're trying to achieve for our customer. So you're able to give the customer what the solution that is going to be long lasting. Um, you're not going to have to revisit that job a year or two down the road. And they're yeah. going to they're going to sing your praises to their neighbors. And believe me, if they have problems, it's likely that their neighbor on the left and their neighbor on the right has problems. Uh, Jerry, that's uh, that's amazing. You touch on that because that's that together. Everyone achieves more. Right? That's the team. Right. Uh, yeah. we, we, we preach that here as well. And the beauty about it is it's the no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one to walk and run away mentality that it, it takes it takes self-humbling to be able to employ that and really stand by it on a daily basis. And I find, yeah, you may lose a couple, but the ones that you punt on and, and pass because you know your limitations and capabilities, there is no substitute for that. Um, and, and while we all seek to be profitable and, and grow our businesses, it's so incumbent upon everybody and listeners out there, please, if you can, just think about this, if nothing else. Well, you know, Jerry, what you're saying is so spot on. You have to be able to know when to employ and bring in the big guns, so to speak, or just the different guns, right? It's not that anybody's lacking. It's just some things take different uh, solutions and bringing that integrated project delivery approach, as we touched on in a, in a prior segment, I, th- that's you cannot replace the value of that. That is so, so incredibly awesome. Um yeah, Jerry, I, I want to just say, if I may, thank you for joining us on, on this morning's segment. I think it's been terrific, unless you've got any other closing remarks you'd like to make, which I can certainly open up uh, to you. Uh, is there anything else you want our listeners this morning to grasp from from uh, your your experiences and that with uh, jacking and or geostabilization? Is there any closing comments you'd like? You know, I think that as I look back at the journey started about a decade ago in this business, you can't overestimate the the benefit of having people around you that have been there and are willing to share their expertise with you. Um, you know, having somebody to bounce ideas off or help you to understand why you do things in a way yeah. Um, supplier. Suppliers are so critical because their their breadth of knowledge is so much larger than yours in most cases. And so calling somebody to find out what an appropriate material would be on this particular application or, hey, this is what I'm experiencing in this in this seawall. Here's a couple of pictures. What would you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, those kinds of things. I mean, spending 30 minutes or an hour or five hours gathering the necessary information before you start a project is going to almost always ensure that that project is successful, profitable, not damage somebody's um, you know million dollar property. We are not talking about sidewalk here, where if you break it, the customer you know has very minor expenses to fix that. We're talking about structures that could hundreds of repair if you damage them. And so taking the time to think property is so critical. Um, in regards to seawalls, and this is something that, that we also provide, and, and that's simple seawall drain. Um, you know, part of the problem with walls bowing is hydrostatic pressure. There's on lakes, we've got the humongous surf boats now, you know, throwing four foot waves over people's <laughs> seawalls. Yeah. That water, that water gets behind and causes tremendous amount of, of pressure with, with regards to tide, tidal 
Uh, you know, you get these big tides that will overtop walls. Well, unlike a lake where the water is relatively static, you know, twice a day, that water's dropping that wall. And if you've got many tons of water behind that wall, you have real problems. Seawall drains and their installation is something that um, seawall drains are poorly maintained. There's generally uh, not enough of them, and they're usually placed in the wrong, wrong location. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're few and far between. They're usually not functional, and they're, they're in the wrong position to do the job properly. So, yeah. again, tapping people that know how to do seawall drains, learning how to do that is a lucrative thing that you can add to your arsenal. You are so in. Gotcha, Jerry. Well, a terrific segment, detail-oriented, technical. Listeners, I hope you got something out of this. Jerry is a consummate expert in his field, and it shows in the last half hour we've gained a, a lot from you, your insight, Jerry. And we want to just say thank you very much again for joining us here on this segment of the Concrete Solutions Network. We wish you the very best on a weekend. Work safely. And uh, listeners, have a great weekend as well. Jerry, pleasure having you on the show. Great to be here. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Yes, sir.